Good afternoon, everyone. We will be starting this webinar at three o'clock sharp. Um, I see many people have already joined in. Um, welcome to all those of you who are already now uh, with us. Uh, I'm sure a lot more will be coming in very shortly. And uh, I see some participants have already put in their questions. So I guess today is going to be a very lively session. So let's just wait for a little bit more till more people come in. Uh, we'll be back with you in another five minutes or so. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. So we'll have, um, we'll give it another five minutes. We'll start at three o'clock. So right now we already have uh, more people joining in. And we'll be back again in about five minutes to kick off today's webinar. For those of you who are already here in the webinar, perhaps you just like to um, say hi in the chat box. You can see chat at the bottom of your screen. Say hi to everyone. Hello, Jesse Fong. Hello, Chin Hui Ng. Thank you for saying hi. Ming Lu Chai, Rose Shamsia, Tan Chi Yong, Asru Bin Ayu. Hi, everyone. Hello, Inchi Abu Hari. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Kauli Fang. Thank you for being here. We will start this session quite shortly in about three minutes. We have an interesting topic today, so I'm sure it's going to be a lively session.
Engineer Muhammad K. Hai, Rosaifi, Tracy Chong, Mr. Bay. Hi, Mr. Bay. Nice to have you with us today. Today's session will be about um, 45 minutes to one hour, but after the presentation, our speaker will be taking uh, the questions and answers session. So it depends on how many questions we receive. So the host, the whole webinar may um, take about one and a half hours maximum. Just one more minute, we will start. So we can see a lot of people are coming into our webinar now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so I'm going to start now. Hi, everyone. And uh, once again, uh, we have great pleasure to welcome you back to the Malaysian Water Association and Malaysia International Water Convention webinar series. And doesn't time fly? Another week has already passed very quickly and today is already our fifth webinar. We hope everyone is well and uh, staying safe. Today, we have with us Ms. Christine To, who will talk to us about construction contracts and the aftermath of the MCO. Christine is from Ma Wing Kwai and Associates, a leading law firm of advocates and solicitors in Kuala Lumpur. Thank you very much, Christine, for taking time to prepare for today's session so that our members and friends from the water industry and construction industry can get to learn more about construction contract disputes and get more clarity on the issues and dispute resolution process. Now, halfway through the webinar, uh, we would like our participants to answer three short questions. Uh, so do participate in this brief survey. And uh, do you have any questions for our speaker? You can key in your questions anytime during the presentation. And Christine will answer your questions at the end of the webinar. The Q&A icon is located at the bottom bar on your screen. Can you see it? I hope everybody can see it. And as usual, all our webinars will be uploaded to YouTube so you can watch them on demand. Just follow us on our Facebook, Malaysia International Water Convention. And all the details of our webinar series and links to YouTube videos will be there. So let me kick off. Unfortunately, today, Dato Kade is not able to join us. So I would like to invite Mr. Lee Kun Yu, Executive Director of the Malaysian Water Association, to say a few words and kick off today's session. Mr. Lee, over to you. Penny, can you on Mr. Lee's um, video? Can you hear us, Mr. Lee? Okay, can? Yes, okay. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. And on behalf of the President of the Malaysian Water Association, Tato, Engineer Abdul Kadeh Mahdain, 
I would like to welcome all of us today this afternoon to the MWA MIWC webinar. And today's event is the fifth in the series organized by the Malaysian Water Association together with the ProTem Group. I'm pleased to see this series of webinar has become increasingly well received by the water industry players and the MWA members. Today, the webinar focus will take a different turn from the purely technical subjects. We will take a look at COVID-19 and its impact on construction and engineering projects. This, I hope, will draw the interest of many members from government agencies, water operators, funding institutions, consultants, contractors and suppliers, and even the service providers. We take the opportunity to thank Ms. Christine To from Mahuin Kwai and Associates who will present a talk on construction contracts and the aftermath of the MCO, looking at it from the legal perspectives. As we are all aware, during the last three months, the government's increased measures to slow the spread or flatten the curve of COVID-19, including closing schools, advising working from home, restricting personal freedoms, and limiting movement for essential workers only has created enormous uncertainty for projects and construction in terms of how these restrictions apply to the work sites. However, things are looking up and getting a little clearer now, for at least with the Recovery Movement Control Order or the RMCO announced recently, which will last until the 31st of August, 2020 with the opening up of more sectors for economic activities. Ladies and gentlemen, as a result of the MCO, construction and engineering projects around the country are being impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in numerous ways, and many projects have stopped. Today's webinar will try to touch on how these profound challenges are being managed, particularly on the water projects and supply chains contracts. I would like to share just a few thoughts on the current impact that has affected our water projects. Firstly, COVID-19 is having a massive impact on construction projects, uh, but the legal implications may vary on the, on the contractual side, and much focus is now being given to the working of standard forms, to the wording of the standard forms where it's used such as the FIDIC, JKR203A, IEM, or the PAM, form of contract. As the COVID-19 situation is developing and reopening of construction sites are anticipated, further issues are arising on how COVID-19 is affecting the ongoing contracts in terms of their rights and liabilities. Number two, at this stage, COVID-19 is not broadly speaking, rendering projects altogether impossible to complete, but it is slowing them down nevertheless, causing delay and disruption even if only because supply chains and workforce have been severely uh, disrupted. Many projects have even stopped usually with the intention to resume work at a later date. This has implications on the state's ability to meet our rising water demand on a timely basis as planned. Number three, in all cases, though where work continues, health and safety risk assessment need to be conducted consistent with medical, scientific and government guidelines and contractors' duty to provide a safe working environment, free workers, uh, uh, free, giving, giving free workers accommodation and the COVID-19 testing. This has implications on cost and the engagement of foreign workers and the conditions they have to comply due to changes in law in inverted commerce as ordered. That said, where there have been specific orders requiring construction sites to close, there are issues arising from contractors' suspension of works, claims for losses and expenses, to extensions of time until the end of the state of emergency period, especially in public works and water supply contracts. I understand the contractors are concerned that they could face delays or increased costs as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. In this regard, the contractors would be well advised to consider whether they have any express entitlements to relief under their contract. As epidemic, as epidemic or pandemic events are not listed as separate relevant events, entitling a contractor to an extension of time 
contractors seeking entitlements resulting from the COVID-19 outbreak would most likely seek to do so under the force majeure a relevant event. Whether it can be relied upon in relation to the COVID-19 outbreak will depend on how the clause is triggered in the contract. All these issues, I believe, will be adequately covered from the legal standpoint in our webinar today. Finally, the IWA hopes the government will offer aid to contractors and businesses negatively affected by the COVID-19 situation. So even if a contractor may have no contractual or legal entitlements or compensation for prolongation costs due to work being significantly delayed or impaired, government aid could be made available to defray some of the ongoing costs incurred or otherwise provide a financial respite. Employers may also be entitled to the benefit of these state aid measures. In this manner, we hope our water projects will continue unabated according to plan to meet the demand and for the benefit of the consumers. In fact, our president, Dr. Kade, is also actively engaging with some of the ministries to talk about this help and aid to the contactors who are negatively affected by the COVID-19 situation. Lastly, I wish to say a big thank you to all participants for registering for this webinar. Please take this opportunity to ask a lot of questions and as it is really, really we can have a legal expert in the MW event. Thank you to Ms. Christine To and also to Protein Group for organizing the webinar. I wish you all a fruitful time together. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Lee. So now, uh... Without delay, I'm going to uh, invite Ms. Christine To to um, start her presentation. Christine? Hi, good evening, everyone. I will share my screen now. Thank you for the introduction, Denise and uh, Mr. Lee. It is my pleasure to be invited to give the speech, to, to give this uh, webinar to the members of uh, MWA today. Without further ado, let's start. Just a little bit about our law firm. Ma Wen Kwa and Associates, we are a small, we are a small medium, we are a, a trusted by small medium enterprise, family businesses and individuals. We are established in 1985 by Datuk Ma, now a consultant with the firm. We are a medium-sized law firm with 22 lawyers and 19 staff. We are a full-service law firm with four departments, corporate, dispute resolution, employment, individual and families. And we have five practice groups, the Asian China Desk, construction, foreign direct investment, real estate, sports, and esports. So about today's top point, force majeure, how it is, what it is, and how it helps. Extension of time, would I get my EOT? I can see that I already have questions about EOT and loss and expenses. I believe it's a burning, those are, these are all burning questions that I will address during this talk and also after the talk. Frustration of contract, does it apply? Mr. Lee mentioned just now that now the contract is harder to perform, but it doesn't seem to be impossible to perform. So how, what does it tell? Whether can I invoke the, frustration, the, the doctrine of frustration of contract? And of course, during this seminar, I will make reference to the normal standard form contract that we apply, that, we, that I commonly see in Malaysia. For example, the PAM, JKR, which is the PWD, FIDIC, and IEM. And lastly, I will end this webinar with a brief introduction of SIPA and how SIPA can help the contractors and the subcontractor in the Malaysia construction industry. Fourth major. To be precise, there is actually no legal definition as to what is 
a false merger. I often ask, got asked, so does this MCO fall under false merger? It really depends on the terms of your contract. It is a creature of the contract. Although you do have case law to sort of try to explain what a false merger means, but it is a definition as to what this um, false merger clause intends to address. So in RHB Capital Bahad, the court states this, it is generally intended to include risk beyond the reasonable contract of a party. In essence, it frees both parties from liability or obligation when an event such as war, riot, or an act of God takes place. So in order to, reply, uh, to rely on this uh, force merger, there must be a force merger in clause in the construction contract. So let's look at PEM. Force merger was defined under PEM, Article 7 AD of PEM 2006 and 2018. So as you guys can see, epidemic falls within the definition of force merger. Next, we will look at PWD 203A, Revision 1. 2010. Fourth major was defined under clause 58.2. I have listed down all the events of fourth major as defined under PWD. You have war, you have military power, uh, absorbed power, natural catastrophe, nuclear explosion, so on and so forth. But we do note that epidemic which is what we have now, COVID-19, is not included as a force major event under clause 58.2. Under FIDIC, the term force major was not used, but to cater for this, it is called exceptional event under FIDIC, and the definition was provided under clause 18. It is beyond a party's control. It is an event which is under, is beyond a party's control. The party could not reasonably have provided against before entering into the contract. Having arisen, such party could not reasonably have avoided or overcome. And it is not substantially attributable to the other party. As you can see, the definition given under clause 18 of Fidic Red Bull is similar to what we have in the case law that I have showed you just now under RHB. Under clause 18 of Fedit Red Book, they go on to give examples of what falls under these exceptional events. Pretty similar to what we have in PEM, but again, I think we have lost Christine there. So explosive. Christine, are you back?
Christine? Can you hear me now? Yes, Christine. I think we lost you for a while just now. Perhaps you can continue okay. now. Yeah. Where did your loss before? I'm so sorry about it. Yeah, it's okay. It must be the connection. Okay. I will continue with the screen sharing, sir. I think you lost at the FIDIC examples. Yeah, FIDIC. There we are. Example. Ah, this one. Right. All right. Thanks, Mr. Lee. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry for the disruption. No worries. No so, worries. Right. So next we will, and, and as I have uh, mentioned just now, epidemic was again not included under exceptional event of FIDIC Red Book. And FIDIC Red Book also defined what happened, also lay down the procedure, I would rather say, that what happened if there is an occurrence of exception of an exceptional event. So you have to give notice to the other part, the counterparty, within 14 days of becoming aware or should have been aware of the exceptional event. And it is also expressly spelled out in clause 19.4 that if the contractor was affected by an exceptional event, then he shall be entitled to EOT. I will address the, EO, the issue of EOT and loss and expenses in a short bit. Let's have a look at uh, IEM. Again, the term force merger was not used in IEM, but rather it is defined as the employer's risk. Clause 20.4 listed down the event, the, exam, the event of what falls under employer's risk. Again, epidemic is not included as an employer risk. Before I go on to the next topic, Employer is defined as the person, firm, corporation identified in the articles of agreement who has accepted the tender. So let's have a look at application for extension of time. For PEN 2006 and 2018, application for extension of time was governed under Cross 23. So what clause 23 says is that you may apply for EOT if you think that your work will be delayed beyond the completion date because of any of the relevant events mentioned in clause 23.8. So clause 23.8 listed 24 relevant events. I think that the applicable clauses are those in clause 23.8a P and W. Clause 23.8A is the fourth merger event. Clause 20, because PEM, as I have discussed just now, epidemic was defined as a fourth merger event. So I think 23.8A is applicable. And possibly 23.8P, compliance with any changes to any law regulations, bylaws, or terms and conditions of an appropriate authority and service provider. And of course, lastly, 23.8 W, suspension of the, the whole or part of the work by an order of an appropriate authority, provided the same is not due to negligence, omission, default, or breach of contract by the contractor on the, or the NFC. So I think that all these events are, is applicable when you want to apply for EOT arising from the COVID-19 MCO. Clause 23 also laid down the procedures. It's a two-step process. First, you need to put in the intention to apply for EOT within 28 days from the commencement of the MCO. This is a condition precedent. Then later on, the second stage is where you have to put in a final claim for EOT within 28 days after the cause of delay. So it's a two step, two stages um, process. And it is also spelled out 
if the contractor failed to comply with the particulars, to give the particulars, it is deemed that the MCO did not delay the completion of the work. This is in relation to the second stage. So please do bear in mind, it is very, very important to know that EOT under PEM is not something as of right. You need to apply for it. I would like to share with you these, uh, require, the notice requirement, the importance of notice requirement. It is held in the case of Ipoh Towers and Diran Bahad. Our my, uh, Justice Mary Lim, as her ladyship was then, and now Justice of the uh, Court of Appeal. Non-compliance of the notice requirement render the matter unavailable for consideration by the architect. So failure to adhere to the notice requirement is fatal. Next, I will, I will go down to um, discuss about PAM, uh, sorry, PWD. So similarly in clause 43.1, PWD listed 10 events. And yes, epidemic is not included as uh, under the definition of force majeure. But I think if you look at clause 43.1, I delay in completion is due to the contractor's inability for reason beyond his control and for which he could not have reasonably foreseen. I think that the delay for arising from the COVID-19 falls, possibly falls under this clause, 43.1 I. Next, we will look at FIDIC. So the effect of an exceptional event was fell down in clause 18.4, and the contractor shall be entitled to EOT. And you have the procedures. The procedures was laid down in 20.2. Similarly, it's a two-stage process. The notice requirement, once again, it is of utmost importance, you must adhere to the notice requirement in order to be entitled to claim for EOT. So this is the second stage where you have to put the full detail. This is quite similar to what we have just looked at under PEM. Extension of time is dealt with under clause 44 of the IEM. An engineer may certify extension to the date of completion by fixing an extended date if there is a delay in the completion of work caused by a relevant event listed in 44.1 sub 1. So further down, you have 44.1c, which says that a relevant an employer is the uh, risk or a combination of the employer risk, as we have looked at just now, is a relevant event under clause 44.1. And then again, similarly, if the contractor considered that there will be or has been a delay, he must serve a notice to the engineer. And again, similarly, you have to include an estimated extended date for the completion in that notice. And uh, I would like to point to you for the 4.2 sub 3, the contractor must act within reasonable dispatch in serving the notice required in clause 44.21. Next, I will address the issue of loss and expenses. Whether you can claim for loss and expenses, similarly like your EOT, it depends on the terms of the contract. But one thing you have to bear in mind, entitlement to EOT does not 
means that you are automatically entitled for a claim for loss and expenses. The issue of time and cost are separate. Loss and expenses are governed most of the time by an entirely separate contractual provision. As you will see later, PEM for EOT is under clause 33, whereas PEM for loss and expenses is governed under clause 24. Whether you are entitled for a claim for loss and expenses very much depends on your contract terms. There is no common law remedy for it. These are the examples I came up with, and uh, I'm pretty sure most of you are uh, well versed with all these loss and expenses. These are just some examples. Let's look at PEM. Clause 24 deals with a claim for loss and expenses. There is a similar provision in both 10, 2006 and 2018. Clause 24.3 listed 14 methods which may lead to a claim for loss and expenses. The relevant provision, I say relevant, is for consideration is 24.3N. But when you, let's have a look at it. Suspension of the whole or part of the works by and or by order of an appropriate authority, provided always that the same is due to negligence or omission on the part of the employer, architect, or consultant. Notice the difference in wording between 23 and 24.3. I think that the COVID-19 MCO and CMCO are not due to negligence or omission on the part of the employer, architect or consultant. And hence, it is unlikely to fall under the relevant event. Because COVID-19 MCO, COVID-19 is a neutral event. It is not attributable to fault of either party. Now I will move on to PWD. The issue of loss and expenses, whether you can claim for it or otherwise, is addressed under clause 44.1. And under 44.1, it is expressly spelled out which are the events that you can claim for loss and expenses. There's only five events. 43.1C, 41.3.1D, E, F, and H. Very briefly, 43.1C deals with suspension of work under clause 50. 43.1D deals with uh, what happens when there is a dispute with neighboring owner. Clause 43.1E deals with instructions issued by, issued by the SO. Clause 43.1F deals with what happened when the contractor did not receive instruction in due time. And finally, H deals with delay in giving possession of the site. Those are the, those are the circumstances where you may claim for loss and expenses. And unfortunately, clause 43.1I was not included as an event to claim for loss and expenses under w, PWD 203A. I would like to also point you to clause 77 obligation. It is expressly spelled out that in the event of any outbreak of illness of an epidemic nature, the contractor shall comply with and carry out such regulation order, et cetera, et cetera. But it is silent as to who should bear the cost. Next, we will look at FIDIC, Red Bull. 
the effect again of uh, of an exceptional event. Just now we have looked at what happened in the event of an exceptional event to EOT. It is spelled out that contractor is entitled shall be entitled for EOT. That's a good news. 18.4 B deals with loss and expenses. It only confines loss and expenses if you fall under subparagraph A to E. So the contract is physics is silent as to what happens if it does not fall under those subclasses. However, as I have um, explained just now, exceptional event, it was defined in FedEx. And they gave example. The example given is not exhaustive. So I think that based on clause 20.2, where the deal, uh, where the clause deal with X, uh, EOT and loss and census, if either party consider that he or she is entitled to an additional payment by the other party and or EOT under any clauses of this condition or otherwise in connection with the contract, the following claim procedure shall apply. So my advice is go ahead and apply under FIDIC if you, are, if you have a FIDIC contract to claim for loss and expenses and to say that COVID-19 is an act for um, satisfied the definition of exceptional event under cross 18 of Philip. In relation to IEM contract, the issue of loss and expenses is covered under clause 20.31. So basically the additional cost for the making good of such risk are to be certified by the engineer under clause 53. So again, like I have said, I think that COVID-19 MCO may fall under operate uh, employer risk under 20.41 D, operation of nature, which an experienced contractor could not have reasonably foreseen or priced for. The ultimate, the valuation still has to be satisfied, uh, certified by the engineer as provided under Clause 53. Again, notice requirement. I cannot stress more the importance of notice requirement. Just an example of uh, case law again, Pabandaran Pembangunan Pulau Pinang. So what happened in that case is that the contractor did not make an application for direct loss and expenses in the quarter the term of the contract. What the contractor did was that he wrote in to reserve his right. He said that these article, article, uh, architect instructions and site instructions have affected our site program and revised construction period. We will submit expenses losses and other claims incurred as a result of the state instruction in due course. The caller will still help in that case. That the respondent act of merely reserving its right to make such a claim at such time as it unilaterally deemed fit clearly does not meet the prerequisites of the contract. In this case, it governed under clause 11, sub 6 of the contract. And uh, in that case, the contractor was not allowed to maintain the claim for loss and expenses. I also invite the participants, all of you, to have a look at this particular article that was posted by the firm and written by myself and my other colleagues. And uh, we have addressed common FAQ in relation to claim for EOT and loss and expenses arising from COVID-19 MCO. So this is basically a conclusion, a table that I have drawn up comparing the, small, uh, the four commonly used 
standard form contract in Malaysia. And the force major event, which clause is, uh, and the relevant provision for force major, EOT, and loss and census. I hope that will be helpful as a, summer, as a table of summary. And before I go on to the next uh, half, second half of my presentation, I think it's time for us to do the uh, survey, Denise. So we pulled up the survey questions. Um, so for all our attendees, can you kindly fill up these three questions? We'll probably give everyone about a minute. There are three questions, so you can scroll it down to read the third question. We have about 200 participants with us now. We hope everybody will just take a minute to answer all these questions. And uh, after the uh, poll, we can immediately display the result. So you need to scroll down to read question number three. So has everybody filled up already? Uh, okay, I think we have, uh, I think there's enough time already. Okay, so here's the result. Stay on the screen handy so our participants can see the result. Question number one. 53% EOT, loss and expenses 2%. You can see number two result. You can scroll down your screen, scroll down the box, the post box. And number three, seventy nine percent says challenging but still manageable. I think we're very happy to see that. <laughs> okay, Penny, I think we can close the poll. Okay, Christine, you can continue. Sure. Okay, everyone, do you have your cup of coffee with you? So don't fall asleep as we are going to continue the second half now. Okay, Christine. I do take cognizance that it is a very heavy topic and uh, not everyone appreciates all the clause and uh, the, and more so I'm talking about four different standard form contracts. So it may, it, it may be heavy and uh, at three o'clock is the best time for tea. So Yes. <laughs> so everybody, <laughs> make sure you have your coffee. <laughs> yes. Okay, Christine. Sure. Oops. Okay. Right, next we will move down to frustration of contract. It is a doctrine. And basically it is, first of all, it's governed by the Contract Act. And it's defined as a contract to do an act, which after the contract is made, becomes impossible. The key term is impossible, or by reason for of some extent which the promisor could not prevent, unlawful, becomes void when the act becomes impossible or unlawful. So basically it's un impossible to perform. And unfortunately, again, the word impossible was not defined in the 
Contract Act 1960. So we will have to look at case law. So in the case of one I Moth, so it states the three elements before you can invoke the doctrine of frustration of contract. Number one, there's no provision has been made in the contract to deal with this particular situation that you're facing. Number two, it is not self-induced. Number three, it is this event render the um, render the event radically different from what which was undertaken by the contract. The court must also find it practically unjust to enforce the original promise. Again, in big industry gas and the heart, the contract has fundamentally changed, which the party did not contemplate at the beginning, at the time of the agreement. The doctrine of frustration is to be confined to very narrow circumstances. The reason being, I think, that commercial bargain should not be lightly avoided or brushed aside merely upon a change of circumstances. So, in order to invoke the doctrine of frustration of contract, it is of very narrow circumstances. And let me address this. So, number one, it depends on the facts and circumstances surrounding the construction contract. If you're telling me that the facts and circumstances of the construction contract is that performance is not radically different or funder has been fundamentally changed, I think that MCO will not give rise to frustration of contract. Arguably, the performance of the contract is harder, but it is not impossible. Next, I would like to touch very briefly before I go to Q&A about SIPA. SIPA stands for Construction Industry Payment and Adjudication Act 2012. This, is, this act came into effect on 15th of April 2014. The aim of this act is to facilitate regular and timely payment by providing a mechanism for speedy dispute resolution. So adjudication is timely because from the first from the time that the from the service of the first cost paper we called it up to the delivery of the decision it will not take more than 105 working days. I will draw the diagram shortly. There you go. So this basically spelled out the whole timeline of SIPA from the issuance of the first cost paper, which is what we call a payment claim, up until the, up until the adjudication reply. That's the last uh, cost paper that you are supposed to deliver under SIPA. From, then on, from there onwards, the adjudicator will have 45 days to deliver the adjudication decision. So why I say not more than 105 days, it is because sometimes the adjudicator can deliver his, his or her decision in less than say 10 days. So instead of 45 days, he can deliver the decision in uh, 10 days. So that will also again shorten the whole entire process. So how can I make use of um, SIPA? So before you can uh, go under SIPA, you must be a construction contract. You must have a construction contract in your hand. It applies to every construction contract made in, in relation to construction work, carry out wholly or partly within the territory of Malaysia, including a construction contract entered into by the government. SIPA does not apply to construction contract by a natural person. For any construction work for a building which is less than four storey high, wholly intended for his or her personal occupation. In that case, you can't go under SIPA, in, then you will have to go to court or arbitration, depending on your contract. So I basically um, listed down the characteristics of um, SIPA. Procedure is summary. Usually it won't involve any hearing, and it is informal. It's a statutory procedure 
in that sense that even you don't need to have a uh, a clause in your construction contract to say that in the event of dispute, party will go for adjudication, which is HIPAA. It is a statutory right given to you. As long as your construction your contract is a construction contract, you can have the uh, you can claim under HIPAA. As I said, it's a short time frame compared to court and arbitration, and it provides an interim temporary solution. In that sense, even though uh, works are ongoing, you can commence the uh, SIPA proceeding. I, but I understand that if you commence SIPA proceeding in the midst of the work, then relationship may sour, you know, so on and so on. There are other implications. But as, per, uh, as given under the rights under the statute, you can commence a SIPA proceeding while the work is still ongoing. As I've said, I mentioned it a, a couple of times. SIPA advantages of one of the advantages of SIPA is speedy. You can commence SIPA proceeding while works are still ongoing. It is relatively cheaper compared to litigation and arbitration. And uh, you can recover in the event that the uh, adjudicator decides in favor of you. You can recover the cost of adjudication. That will include all the costs in relation uh, that paid to AIAC, your adjudicator costs, and of course your solicitor costs as well. So I do invite you if you want to know more about uh, how much does it cost for edu uh, the adjudicator fees, please have a look at uh, this particular link. And uh, other advantages of SIPA is that you can get direct payment from the principal. Once you obtain an uh, adjudication decision against, let's say you are a subcontractor and you, uh, you uh, obtain a SIPA decision against the contractor, and then with that decision, you can get direct payment from the principal. I do invite you to have a read on my article. This article again was uh, written by myself and my colleague in relation to getting direct payment from the principal under section 13 of SIPA. Okay, this is my mobile and this is my email. If you do have any questions which I cannot address, which I don't have enough time to address by, by, the, end, by the end of this seminar, feel free to call me, drop me a text or drop me an email. I will try my best to attend to all the uh, questions that you have. Let's now look at the question Oops. Denise, I can't seem to pull up the question though. Oh, mm. okay. Thank you. The first, uh, let me just put this up. For the first question says, for the loss and expenses claim, do we fall under CL forty three point one clause forty three point one? How can know, we claim this hang loss? On, Denise. Denise, let me see. How do I? Can do? you can you click on Q and A at the bottom of your screen? Nothing pops up though. Let me try again. Strange. Denise, uh, would you be able to copy and paste and share it in the chat with me? Okay. Yeah, I think that would be better rather than you reading it out for me. No, I don't think I can copy it. Oh, you can't copy as well? Yeah, it cannot be copied. Let me repeat the first question. Oh, how about you send it to my WhatsApp? It's quite a long one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. I got it. You got it already? Right. Yes, Good. I got it the first question. We have submitted an intention to claim for EOT and loss and expenses under the suspension of work, but the client replied that this is under force merger, which is caused by independent party. So we are not entitled to claim. May I know the legal point of view? 
Okay, first of all, just now we have looked at the uh, four different types of standard form contract. It really depends on the terms of your contract. If, so if you're telling me that you, the, the employer refused to give you the extension of time simply because you cited the wrong uh, provision. Yeah, wait, let me see. Still can't, I still can't look at the question. Ah, yeah. Okay, back to the question. You, I need to know what is force merger defined under your contract. And also what suspension of work, uh, how is suspension of work defined under your, your contract in order to answer that question. For suspension of work under, if let's say you're talking about PAM, I have shared one of the, one of the grounds to ask for EOT under 23.1 is actually this suspension of work. So I do need to know more information before I can answer that. It depends, it really de depends on what kind of uh, contract you have and what are the terms of the contract. Can we claim? Can claim? Can we claim for additional cost resulted from the compliance to the authority's SOP and requirement under compliance of new authority requirements? Otherwise, is there any other clause that entitles a contractor to claim for such additional cost incurred? This is a loss and expenses claim. Again, it depends on the terms of your contract. If you are telling me if it's PAM, looks like unlikely because uh, as what I've shared, for FIDIC, it is possible. For IEM, it is possible. For PWD, unlikely again. So it depends on the terms of your contract and which, if you are using a standard form, it depends on which standard form. And if you are talking about bespoke, more so, it will depend on how it is agreed upon between the parties. The next question. Though we are allowed to start work under CMCO, but the local authorities such as CBKL have not started work, so there is a delay in the issuance of permit to work. Can a contractor claim for EOT and loss and census for this period? This one... Okay, you see in your contract, right? It doesn't say that CMCO or MCO, it, it doesn't confine to just that period. Because of COVID-19 and it caused all this delay, I think by that alone, you will fall under that uh, particular clause that you're looking at. Depends on which, again, depends on which uh, standard form contract that you're looking at. So, but my conclusion is that, my, my, what I'm trying to say is that your entitlement for EOT not necessarily means that it is only confined to that period of um, uh, MCO or CMCO. For example, the disruption in the supply chain. Although we have started, like we have to resume work, whatnot, but the supply chain got disrupted and you still can't get your stuff and you still can't get your people. So that will also have to be taken into consideration. It's not confined to just the period of the uh, MCO. It's the next question. Is the movement control order announced by YB Prime Minister equivalent to force merger under the contract? Number one, it is not an... Um, again, you... Okay. This, this is a question that I got very, very often. I hope that by now, you all do appreciate that there is no legal definition as to what is a forced merger. You need to look at your contract to see how it is defined. For PAM, there is a, there is a list and there is a definition. For FIDIC, it is called exceptional event. For, uh, so it depends on the contract term. So whether... Uh, MCO falls under an event of a force merger event. It depends 
on your contract. Is the conditional movement control order equivalent to force merger under the contract? Oh, okay. So this one is, uh, is the same question, but it is about conditional movement control order. Again, my answer is the same. It depends on the terms of your contract, how, it is, how a force merger was defined under your contract. And also, please bear in mind that the, claim, the procedure or entitlement to claim for EOT and loss and expenses are different. You may be entitled to claim for EOT uh, because of this force major, but because of this COVID nineteen MCO, but you might not be entitled to claim for loss and expenses. So just now, like what we have seen in the survey, most of them I see can get your EOT claim, but the uh, entitlement for loss and expenses is very much significantly lower. Based on, P, based on the PWD 203, how many days of EOT entitlement to claim? This, I, the power to claim is under by the SO. I don't think there's a cap in the PAM, uh, PWD. For loss and expenses, for loss and expenses claim, do we fall under clause 43.1L? How can we claim for this loss? Again, you need to look at the procedures. I Clause 43.1, I'm assuming is PAM. No. Just bear with me. I'm, going, uh, I'm assuming it's PWD because it's a continuation of that question. Let me very quickly look at this. I'm going to pull up uh, PWD. Forty three by one L. I think yes, for this, yeah, I think this is what I have shared as well, L. I think it's an I, because I don't think there's an L under 43.1. So 43.1, I say that the contractors in a, uh, let's, okay, to have some context, uh, cross, okay, you know what, I'm going to share this. So that it's easier for us to see. So this is clause 43 of uh, PWD. And the question is whether 43.1 L for can they claim for uh, loss and expenses under 43.1 L? Number one, first thing, there's no L. I think it's I probably a typo. So if it's uh, under I, I think COVID-19 MCO likely to fall under 43.1 I, but do take note that clause 43 deals with extension of time. It doesn't deal with loss and expenses. And loss and expenses is dealt with under clause 44. And I've also shared just now during the webinar, Clause 44, to claim for loss and expenses, it only confined to 43.1 C, D, E, F, and H. Okay. That is, I can, I, I, I able to look at the questions already. Okay. So, yeah, great, great. You don't have to copy and paste already. <laughs> All right. So, I have answered this. 43.1, how do I, okay, so next. Yes, 
would like to request for PPT file of your presentation. Sure, can. Please drop me a uh, please drop me an email, please. And uh, if based on PWD uh, design and build, is there any potential claim for loss and expenses? Hang on, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. I, if I'm not mistaken, the design and build is similar to 203. Let me pull up the uh, design and build and have a look at it in a short bit. I will address the others as well. I will address the others first. If the employer if the employer has not given any notice of suspension of work for the MTO event, can the contractor apply for EOT? Number one, again, I have to repeat, it depends on the number one terms of your contract. If let's say I use um, TAM as an example, there's different grounds where you can claim for EOT. Suspension of work by I, uh, by the appropriate authority is just one of the grounds that was listed in PEM, for example. So, I number one, I need to look at the contract. It depends on the terms of the contract. If you are looking at PEM, I think that it is not confined to just suspension because I have shared just now, you actually have, I think that the relevant ground for expense, extension of time, there's three grounds you may, you may consider. So what is your opinion whether MCO or CMCO applicable for this fourth merger? Again, I have to say that it's taking a while to understand the question. Fourth merger is, again, there is no legal definition as to what amount to fourth merger. There's no legal definition. If you look at the contract, it's define in the contract itself what is a they they don't want to use force merger they can use exceptional events so it depends what was defined under uh, this force merger and whether this cmco can fall under this event i think as a general rule of thumb i do think that it is something that's beyond parties expectation and is attributed to no fault of either party I think that it will fall under the, the general definition of force measure. Can a, can a contractor claim for extension of insurance due to the MCO? This is again a very common question that I got. This is actually a loss and expenses claim. And uh, if 10, what is the specific cost under PEM? Again, I've addressed it just now. For PEM, I, so far, I don't think I've come across a cost in PEM that may help you to claim for the insurance, the extra insurance coverage. Based on PWD 2003, from 18th of March until today, can we claim EOT until we resume? Oh, I, I better click. Okay. Based on PWD 2003, from 18th of March until today, can we claim the EOT from 18th of March until we resume to work on 1st of June? This is because MCO, CMCO, and SOP compliance all general workers have to get COVID-19 yeah, COVID screen test results before they can resume work. 
the screening are delayed due to available test kit and schedule when can test. I think yes, I think likely you can get it based on PWD, based on our last uh, discussion just now and the relevant provision for EOT. Again, I, like I said, EOT is not confined and should not confine to just during the MCO period. It's, it is an event and lead to the delay. The delay was not caused just by the movement control order. It is every other thing that is consequential thereafter. What can you okay, wait, let me, what can you do when you win in SIPA but the losing party refused to pay up? Okay, I think that this question of uh, losing party not willing to pay up is not only confined to SIPA. I do have clients in the arbitration and uh, litigation who refuse to pay even after the party have win. So one of the uh, things that you can do is to, of course, like have shared, get, try to get direct payment from the employer under Section 30. That I think is pretty effective. And uh, actually recently that you, you might also consider issuing of uh, a winding up petition pursuant to that decision. Okay, contractor are given Contractor are given opportunity to restart operation provided that they comply with the strict SOP. Okay. If they are unable to comply due to uneconomic cost to comply within the SOP, can they still claim EOT until much later date when SOP requirements are retracted by the or by the government? I see. So you're okay. It is, a, it is a legal principle as well that you as the contractor have to mitigate law. Okay? So you have, you have to try your best to uh, adhere to the completion date because uh, COVID-19 MPO is something that, like I said, is uh, due to no fault of uh, either party. Okay? So when now they can, you can now resume work and the reason why you don't want to uh, Start work, so to speak, is because it's, it's, it's probably very expensive for this uh, to comply with all these SOP. But then the, the employer or the contractor may come back and bite you and say that you have to, it's already opened up and you have the obligation to mitigate the delay. So by you prolonging the test and by you prolonging not complying with the SOP, you are causing further delay to the, uh, to the progress of the work. In that sense, then they might not uh, approve your application for EOT later on. Must a notice be agreed by both parties if there is a dispute with regards to the notice? Would it be enforceable? Uh, no, the notice, I don't think the notice uh, has to be agreed by both parties. Most of the time, it's, you have to give notice as to, okay, this is my intention to claim for EOT. Okay, and now this is my detail. If they are not happy with, they, are, they, they don't agree with your, uh, whatever you have stated, then they will have to either reject your application for either EOT or loss and expenses with uh, particulars and with, with, uh, reason why they are not agreeable with your application. But having said that, they cannot then say that your notice is not good. Your notice is good, it's just that they are not uh, agree, agreeable with your notice. Okay, this one, I think I've answered that. This one also I have done for a lot of this. This 
question. For the loss and expenses claim, we are fall under cost 43.1 L. Again, this is similar to what I've just answered. And again, I, I do not know cross 43.1 L of what. I'm just assuming it's PWD. And uh, PWD doesn't have L as well, it's I. And 43 of PWD deals with EOT and not loss and expenses. Loss and expenses was dealt with, it's dealt with under cost 44. Okay. I think I have pretty much answered the question. How, okay. This one is, however, there is no definition or list given in on this force module. Oh, sorry. Honor 5C, this is a continuation of your previous question. So JKR Sarawak form for, of contract PWD 75. I am pretty sure that there will be a definition of force majeure because 41 dealt with uh, event of delay. Force majeure, it is there, but it will be defined some, uh, in, maybe you want to check cost 58. It's not defined under 43, but please do check cross 40, 58. Okay, done that. I think I have pretty much done that already. Can you claim for expenses to comply SOP to commence work? Again, this is, uh, I think this is loss and expenses. You have to look at the terms of your contract, whether you are entitled for it or not. We have a very important question here. Let me see. In most of forms of contract, there is EOT cost for delay due to client SO employer instruction. For government project, the client slash employer is government. So my question is, can the government's MCO or stop work order to be considered as instruction for client or employer under the or employer and contractor use this kind of cost to claim EOT and loss and expenses? Thank you. Number one, I do I, I understand your question. And uh, although from the perspective, it may seem that it is government, it's one entity, but you need to look at the terms of the contract to see who is your employer and under the contract, who has the power to issue the suspension order. That again, depends on the terms of the contract. But if you say you want to use the announcement by the government that, uh, okay, this, there's this movement control order and now everything has to be suspended. That fall under a suspension order. It's arguable. I, I really need to look at the terms of the contract to see what defines suspension and who has the power to give that suspension order in your contract to answer that question. This one I've answered similar. Some of the questions that you all, um, uh, some of the questions, uh, the least some of the questions was actually repeated. So 
I, I will just have to go through it very quickly. Please. Yeah, I think you can skip the questions that yeah, are... Yeah, there, there are a few, with, uh, quite a number of people actually. This is a very this is a very interesting question. For new statutory requirement in regards to COVID nineteen, other than loss and census clause in clause forty two, actually it's 24, 24 in ten two thousand and six, is clause four point one and or four point two of ten two thousand and six relevant to claim for extra cost incurred in order to meet the SOP? So four point one and four point two, if I'm not mistaken, it deals with discrepancy. Yeah. 4.1 and 4.2 is statutory obligation, statutory requirement, and inconsistency with statutory requirements. I think there's a room for argument. I do think that there's a room for argument. But when I read this particular cross, right, it, it gives me the impression it is to deal with what happens if um, what the architect has said in the in the drawing, let's say, is inconsistent with what you see in the in the at site. So it gives me the impression that uh, all these four point one and four point two deal with this particular issue. But I do take connections that it is arguable that you can fall, you can possibly fall under four point one and four point two. That is a is a very good question. Is there any, currently any cases on EOT loss and sensor SIPA due to MCO and CMCO? Can you share, discuss a bit as an example? Unfortunately, not yet, because court just resumed not that long ago. And I think the general sentiment of the public is that they want to wait and see. And uh, I think people are generally very busy applying for EOT and uh, loss and sensors instead of bringing people to court because of this uh, 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 MCO. So um, unfortunately, I don't have any ca uh, case law now to share with you. And uh, if I do, I will. And uh, I will put it up as a, in the form of article. Is it best to terminate the contract or proceed? Where is it? Oh, there. Is it best to terminate the contract or proceed with contract closure if both parties agree not to proceed with the scope of work affected due to MCO? <laughs> okay, number one, I think this is a commercial question. I, I think you have to think whether it is the most commercially viable to do that. But if you do agree, if you do uh, parties agree to terminate the contract, I advise that look at the contract terms as to how you should properly terminate and how you should cater for uh, uh, the obligation of the part as of the date of termination. Sorry, uh, sorry I, I need to, okay, I will share with everyone. And that, PWD condition of contract, the extended completion date was due, was due during MCO, okay, and the contractor has applied for their EOT accordingly before MCO. So it means your date of completion is during MCO itself, okay. If the employer has the right to deduct LD, L, I mean, it's a liquidated as a pain damage from the contractor. How about during normal period, if the employer has the right to deduct LD? Okay, there's two questions to this. I'll address the first question. Whether the, the fact that you have applied for EOT. So if, they, if the employer agreed with your, uh, allowed your application for EOT, and then in that case, no LAD should be imposed upon you because they have already extended your uh, date of completion. How about normal period? If the employer have the right 
the right to deduct LAD for the delay in the progress in the completion of work. Number one, again, is the contractual right. You need to look at the terms of the contract to determine whether the employer has that particular right. Okay. If they do, then you have to look at the procedure in the LAD clause. There will be certain procedures, whether they have to issue the certificate of non-completion, they have to give you notice, all these things, it has to be complied with before the employer can impose LAD on you. Okay, I think I have pretty much no new answers and uh, no new questions coming in. Okay, this last one, Larry. If the client gives an official instruction to resume work today, can we claim an EOT up to the date of instruction or only up to the date the government allowed construction to resume? I think that your application for EOT it has to be up to the time where the, it has to be that period of time where this MCO affect you factually. If let's say for example, okay, the government say that you can resume work, but your, your client actually tell me that, no, 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 I don't want you to resume work. I want you to stay on for whatever reason. So that one is something that the client has given you instruction to do. And of course, uh, assuming that there is a due compliance with the procedures. So that, I think, will cover the part where your client asks you to refrain from uh, commencing work. The EOT should cover that part. Okay, Denise, I think I'm pretty much done. Before, all, all these are uh, the one that's left is repeated. Okay, so let me just close this. <laughs> <laughs> you must be tired now. <laughs> I'm very excited actually to look at all these questions. These are very interesting questions. A lot of them have uh, given me very interesting questions actually. And, uh, these yeah. are, uh, uh, and of course, these are very common questions and uh, burning questions by uh, a lot of them. It's not that I wish to address all of you. The issue is that because each of the standard form, and more so, uh, we, I, I have covered the four standard form, there are also uh, construction culture, which is bespoke. So I, I can't tell you what is your rights and uh, obligation if I don't see the contract, you see. All right. Yeah. Okay, so I think if any of our participants want to know more, you are welcome to um, send an email to Christine or send yeah. an email to Malaysian Water Association. Um, just contact us and then we can pass your question to Christine to answer them. Yes, I have so, given my contact yeah. in my slides. So uh, do feel free to drop me a text or email, no issue. Okay, thank you, Christine. So, uh, Thank you uh, to Malaysian Water Association for today's webinar. Uh, Mr. Lee, are you there? Is, do you have anything else you wish to add? No, no. Thank you very much, Christine, and thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, Christine, for your uh, invaluable contribution and your time today. So last but not least, we want to thank all our MW members and friends from the water industry and the construction industry for joining us today. And next Tuesday, uh, we will be talking about important but neglected aspects of water treatment plant life cycle. And uh, we have our speaker, Dr. Ramakrishna from TUV SUD, who will be joining us. And uh, we'd like to invite everyone back again next week for some new insights. So do follow us on our Malaysia International Water Convention Facebook page for details of all our webinars, the updates and the links to our uh, YouTube. Thank you again, and um, may you all have a productive week ahead. So let's meet virtually again next Thursday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. Have a nice week ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.